Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Melanie Campbell, President of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Derek Johnson, President and CEO of the NAACP. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Reverend Siobhan Arline Bradley, President of the National Council of Negro Women. Please welcome Ron Busby, Senior President of the U.S. Black Chambers. Please welcome Reverend Al Sharpton, Founder and President of National Action Network. All right, can y'all hear me? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Essence Fest for 2023. I hope y'all having a great time. Listen, today's conversation, we're gonna be framing a very important discussion around digital divides in the black community. How many of you know that broadband is a civil rights issue? Access to broadband means you need access to healthcare, your money, your education. If you had little ones like me trying to log on during COVID, broadband is a major issue. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about how black women in the black community are crucial to hold our states accountable for the funds that have come down from the infrastructure bill. You're gonna hear us talk a little bit about that. So Mel, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get us started in this conversation. All right, Reverend Siobhan, I'm gonna start off with you. How's everybody doing right. out there? Y'all okay? At the, the Essence Festival? So Reverend Siobhan, according to McKinsey and Company, approximately 40% of black American households, as opposed to 28% of white American households, don't have high speed fixed broadband. Yeah. In a digital age, what are the con contributing factors to these disparities? So I think very specifically, African Americans traditionally have been marginalized in many sectors. Education is one of them. Uh, the affordability of broadband has been a major issue. Many families and households are unable to afford the actual expense to have broadband. And one major issue has also been around access to income. We've got to connect jobs to education to broadband. These issues have literally historically been a major part of black family experiences. And one of the reasons why we're discussing the disparities is because those contributing factors really are coming from larger policy challenges that we've had. So I would say those are the major issues that are connected and why we need to discuss this further. Thank you, thank you. And my brother, another mother, Derek Johnson, President and CEO of the NACP. Can we give my brother a hand? So Derek, not only are disparities seen in computer uh, ownership and internet enabled devices, uh, this issue is now a, co a consequence of lower level of digital readiness. Is that an ongoing driver of larger gaps in black American representation in jobs that require digital skills? So three responses to that. Young people who are exposed to opportunities pursue those opportunities. The problem with the, the divide in jobs is far too many African Americans have not been exposed because the tech industry are on the coastlines. It's in the Silicon Valley, around Stanford, it's in Boston, around MIT, and a few other places where there's not the density of young African American children who understand what's possible. Secondly, when you consider how many of our young people are gamers and they're not connecting the reality of being a gamer with all of these games are also equated to opportunity on the side for jobs, it is incumbent upon us to help them understand not coding, because coding is about to go out with AI, but they actually hold the key to what the jobs are in the future. So many of us, for the NAACP, for example, we're launching a VC fund so we can fund innovators in the tech space so they can see what's possible and give them that, the seed money. And then thirdly, the broadband question 
must be mapped. Equity must be mapped. The money that's coming down will be diverted to high growth area, i.e. white areas, and not existing infrastructure. Broadband is a public utility like nothing else we've seen in the past, including electricity. And so if we don't map the equity, expose our young people to what's possible, and then uh, let them see what they're currently doing with gaming is actually opportunity on the other side, we're going to be, be behind the curve. Thank you, Derek. So, Ron, you know it's all about the money, right? You know it's all about the money, President and CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Com Black Chambers. So limited broadband access compounds the numerous systemic inequity barriers for black businesses. Since the pandemic, it is worse. How does this directly affect black business owners' internet visibility? Great question. Can you hear me? Yes. Great question. Um, for those of you that don't know, during the pandemic, black America lost 41% of our businesses. Between the months of February and April of 2020, we lost 442,000 firms. Most of them are the firms that we supported across the country. Since then, we've increased that growth rate, so we've opened up the majority of them. But when you ask them the reason that they did not make it, there were two questions and two answers. The first one was lack of information. We just did not know what we did not know. We did not know where to go. We did not know what to do. And the second one was access to capital. And so with this new infrastructure bill that's coming down, we have to think differently. Uh, the businesses that did survive all were able to pivot to make sure that they had e-commerce, they were be able to be found on social media platforms, and we've got to make sure that we're doing proactive activity versus reactive activity. Black women are going to be that e economic driver for us in the future, and so I implore each and every one of you to make sure that you're not just starting businesses, but we've got to have conversations about mergers and acquisitions. The opportunities that are coming down the pike are large in size and scale. Our mom and pop businesses, our single employee firms are not going to be able to take advantage of many of the contracts that come down. And so we've got to talk about size, we've got to talk about scale, and we've got to talk about merging, as well as acquiring other firms to make sure that we're doing two to two that equals seven and eight because we no longer have the opportunity to grow organically to take advantage of these uh, firms that are coming down and opportunities that are coming down right now. Black women are there. We've got to make sure that we're providing the capital as well as the techno technology to make sure that they're successful long term. And, and, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Reverend Al, I know I have a question for you, but I'm going to add a, a twist to that question. We cannot ignore what's happening what happened coming out of that Supreme Court and how it impacts even what we're sitting here talking about today. So if you could give us your thoughts about why it matters about what's happening to the Supreme Court, affirmative action, the tax, and the things that are happening. Uh, but also uh, the question that I was charged to ask was how is the, the digital divide affecting students and continuing to perpetu perpetuate a system of educational injustices? Well, thank you. Let, let me uh, start with the Supreme Court because it feeds into your question. When they decided yesterday to go against affirmative action, they can sugarcoat it any way they want. They set us up in a trajectory to where they're now saying race consideration is unconstitutional. That's what they said. Now, I talked to a governor today, I did want to draw with another one, who say they fear that if they take infrastructure money and say we're going to target, that we want to make sure black business gets their share, that any white company could sue us, use this as a legal precedent, and then they have another case in front of this court that would then hold that up. So they've got us in a tight squeeze. That's why all of the folks that you know that didn't vote, tell them their non-vote is what got us in this jam. People talking about what no difference between Trump and Hillary. The difference is three people on the Supreme Court that killed affirmative action and today killed student debt loan. That's the difference. So all of us need to really get on folk about we got to vote. 
my friends tell me, yeah, Rev, but I ain't into that. I want reparations. If we can't get affirmative action, how are we going to get reparations? I mean, well, who are we going to get it from? The folk that wouldn't give you affirmative action going to say, we're going to give you a trillion dollars in reparations. Let's talk like we got good sense. We're going to have to fight this thing step by step, moment by moment, common sense, because they have out-organized us. And we've gotten too complacent, and we've sat back and allowed them to do it. The digital divide was no more exposed than when we had two and a half years of the pandemic. They were telling our kids and their kids, do your homework online. Well, if you were in a desert area, you couldn't go online. So the fact that we have discrimination in the broadband world was no more exposed than the segregated broadband areas during uh, the, the whole question of the pandemic. We went from 246 years of slavery to 100 years of segregation. Now we're in a broadband Jim Crow layout, and we've got to break that up not because it's trendy, but because you cannot exist in the 21st century without having equal access to the broadband and to all that we need to do with technology. This is not mandatory. This is not cute. It's not something where, you know, years ago, I'm going to give my kid a laptop for Christmas. No, you're going to give him a laptop so he got a lap because they are putting us out of business and putting us in the, in, in back off into the margins and out of the mainstream. In two days, in two days, they killed affirmative action and today's student debt loan, which is disproportionately in our community. In two days, they showed us who they are. The question is, are we gonna show them who we are? Hey, thank you. We, so, so we, so we're here at Essence Party with a Purpose. But this is about purpose. Can we just say purpose? Real talk. So Derek, we're in the South. We are in the South. Yes, we are. So with all that's going on, all, we keep talking about these big numbers, 42 billion here, all this. How, because we want to go to each of you all, what are the solutions? What should folks be doing to make sure we access those dollars for our community? Because it it's a game changer. It is about being able to build black wealth and, and be, have a strong black businesses. So the rural South, so how do we make sure? And what's it we should be doing besides having this conversation? What is the call to action? Well, we sit in the city of New Orleans where you have majority black leadership. They should have already developed their plan to access the money and the plan to engage black business owners. The black business community should also be having an agenda to understand where to tap into the money because it's at the federal agencies that come down to the states and go to the local jurisdictions. Electing black folks who are not accountable to the money in the black community is a waste of our vote. But voting for black folks and white folks who understand we're casting our vote to protect our voting rights, to ensure public policies are in place, but also that the money reign in our community is all a part of the same conversation. Elections have consequences. And if we are not measuring our vote to get the outcomes from the dollars, we are not doing our communities a just service. So whether you're talking about Atlanta or Charlotte or New Orleans or Pine Bluff, Arkansas, Jackson, Mississippi, Savannah, all of those are black cities in the South. And I, I give you 2024, there will be another Southern state to flip other than Georgia. The fear of a black America is coming through the South because that's where 52% of all black folks live. We have the power, now we must use it. Thank you, Derek. Now, Sh Sh Reverend Siobhan, we got three reverends up here. <laughs> you know, sometimes I try to fake like one, Rev, right? <laughs> Hey, wait, wait, got who's the third? Because I know two. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, excuse me. Excuse me. No, there's, I ain't preaching. There's two plus me sometimes acting like I'm one Baptist last AME, y'all. And I was married to a preacher. That's another conversation. So, Reverend Siobhan, black women, Yeah. we are heads of household. We are, you know, and so when we're talking about this issue and what it can or cannot do, 
What do black women need to know why this is important to yeah. make sure that our families uh, can not only survive but thrive? I want you to remember three letters, ACP, the Affordable Connectivity Program. The infrastructure bill, which was a bipartisan bill that was signed by this current administration, that bill happened because of black women and black voters who pushed the envelope. I want black women to understand something. We are the most reliable voting bloc in the history of these United States of America. And because of your advocacy, the ACP program came out of that bill. You know what that is? The connectivity program gives families access to broadband that are living on specific income levels. What I found is that there are 35 million households that do not have access to broadband that could take advantage of this program and have free internet in their homes. I'm asking you, Essence, to get the word out on those three letters. Say A, C, P. The Affordable Connectivity Program. And NCNW is telling black women across the country, not only are we heads of households, but we are earners. We are driving economies. We are business owners. We are homeowners. We are mothers. We are sisters. We're bankers, chauffeurs too. But we are out here engaging in this conversation. And if we don't get connectivity, we will be left out to the wolves. Because right now, broadband is just like breathing. If you don't have broadband, you don't have access. So please call on your states. Find out where your broadband the departments are in your states to find out what's the accountability call. Where are you sending our money, Governor so-and-so? And find out where those funds are going so that we can ensure our families have access. Thank you. And I'm going to uh, say this. So the bipartisan infrastructure law that was signed in 2021 provides $65 billion. Say billion. B. <laughs> right. In federal dollars for broadband, including $44 billion that will flow directly to states as part of the Broadband uh, Equity Access and Deployment. And all these acronyms, BEAD, and, and again, State Digital Equity Capacity Grant Programs. So Ron, uh, black businesses, right? Uh, bi small businesses, black businesses, how, for folks who are entrepreneurs out here, what should they know about how they can access those resources to grow their businesses. And in some cases, make sure your businesses survive or if you got an idea. This is an opportunity for you to be looking at how you can grab a hold of some of those resources. So tell us how we make some money off of our tax dollars that we pay. Because understand this, this is our money. And I know this is, not a, this is not a political conversation, but the way we got the money, the way these billions of dollars got there, for our companies to be able to access those dollars to build our broadband was because we voted in 2020, 2020 and 2022. So let's be real clear how we got here and how we got this money so we can build that business. So Ron. So the federal government usually paints this broad brush of minority programs. It has not worked for our community. For the first time, the President of the United States, President Biden, went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, the birthplace of our Black Wall Street. And for the first time in this country's history, we disaggregated the numbers. The minority spend, as they call it, was actually 1.8% went to the Asian community, 1.76% went to the Hispanic community, and 1.5% went to black businesses. 1.5%, that's it. You want to ask, well, where is the money going? 78% of all of the federal dollars, all of the contracts went to white women. So when women have the conversation about women's programs, women's right, when we as collectively say minority programs understand we've got to be intentional. We've got to say black and get away from saying minority because it has not worked for us. The second thing is we've got to be transparent. We want to know what's behind those conversations and what is it doing for our community specifically. And the third thing, it's gotta be about accountability. This is an election conversation. For the last eight years, we heard a lot about making America great again. And we as black people say, we want America to be great as well. But in order for there to be a great America, there must be a great black America. And in order for there to be a great black America, we must have great black businesses. And in order for them to have the great black businesses, we need great black chambers, 
and we need your support. If you have a black business, get certified, free of charge. Write this down, B-Y-B-L-A-C-K dot U-S. Corporations and federal governments are saying, Ron, we want to do more business with black firms, but we can't find them. We now have a program that allows you to be found free of charge across the country. And the second one is they say, well, we don't have the size and scale. We don't need more new businesses. We need our businesses to do more mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, and where and when it makes sense, we've got to be talking about consortiums. The opportunities are large and they're today. We've got to be prepared to take advantage of them today and we've got to start making plans right now. Thank you, Rob. I know we're out of time, but we, have, we want to ask Reverend, uh, Reverend Al to just close us out. What should folks do when they go home? Well, I think first thing you need to do is clearly organize in your area to not only tell them to vote, but to have an agenda that says that the black community, given this under siege point that we're at, must be specific about access to broadband, must support what Reverend Shafan is talking about. Many of us are going to be in Washington August 26th raising these issues for the anniversary of the March on Washington. 60 years later, look at where we are. 60 years after Dr. King went to Lincoln Memorial, we're going back saying they've just killed affirmative action. They just killed student loans. We are not fulfilling the dream yet. We need to be, we can't let them out march us. People talk about what we got from marching. The fact you checked in a hotel in New Orleans didn't have to go to the colored side of town. That's what we got out of March. And we need to stop talking about what we can't do, remember what we have done, and go forward. We came inside of 100 years from walking off plantations in, in, in uh, 1865, January 1st, when it went into effect, the Emancipation Proclamation. We walked off plantations with no money no literacy because it was against the law for us to read and write and didn't know our families because we couldn't marry. In a hundred years, we went from there to the March on Washington in 63. And then from there, we went from putting a black man with a black wife with two black kids and the mom-in-law in the White House. Don't tell us what we can't do if we get up and do it and stop telling ourselves that we're going to be measured by other people's rule stick, measured by ourselves. Look how far we come. Yes, we took a downside or we took a backup or we took a, 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 a retreat yesterday and today, but we've taken worse than this and we fought through it. We got to keep fighting. Thank you, Reverend M. I'm Melanie Campbell. Um, uh, convener of the Black Women's Roundtable, and I'm gonna do like Joyce Beatty, approve of all of your messages. Thank you, Essence, and thank you, AT&T.